You're listening to KRUULP 100.1 FM, the voice of Fairfield, Iowa, and beyond the Midwest only solar powered radio station. My name is Dennis Mundy. My show is Speaking Freely. And uh, on a special edition of Speaking Freely, I'll be joined by my co host, Phil Goldberg. Mr. Goldberg is the author of American Veda uh, and uh, on the lecture circuit. He uh, has also written uh, many other books. Uh, our focus, uh, Phil and I, will be on uh, interviewing folks in the area of uh, spirituality. Our first guest today is uh, Mr. John Kepner. He is the executive director of the International Association of Yoga Therapists. Uh, there will be a symposium this June 4th to June 7th, 2015, uh, a symposium on yoga therapy and research in Newport Beach, California. Uh, John, thank you so very much for joining Phil and I and coming on the show today. Thank you for inviting me. Phil, why don't you start the questioning? Okay, good to be with you again, Dennis. John, um, everybody listening has heard the word yoga, and we know that yoga is a huge, uh, hugely popular uh, endeavor these days, and um, with yoga studios virtually on every street corner. Um, in the evolution of yoga in, in the West, yoga therapy is a relatively new phenomenon. So perhaps you can begin by explaining what yoga therapy is, and we'll take it from there. Sure. Yoga therapy is an orientation to the practice of yoga. Okay. So Krishna Macharya used to talk about four different orientations. One was extreme fitness, it's called that Asanga yoga practice or things like that. Another might be daily regular maintenance of your body and your emotions. It's called yoga for most people most of the time. You could call it yoga for spiritual support. And the fourth one, which everybody needs at some point, is yoga therapy. And that is helping a person with some kind of, I'm going to call it a health condition at the moment, such as back, chronic low back pain or asthma or heart disease or depression or, you know, if they're taking chemotherapy, they don't know whether they're going to live or die. So yoga has lots of applications to address those many dimensions of the human, of the human being and their suffering. But still, yoga therapy is only a small fraction of yoga. Yeah, John, let me ask you a question. Uh, you're, uh, how long have you been involved in the practice of yoga, and did you originally get in because you had a health issue or you were looking for uh, some deeper experience in life? I started right before I went to college, and I uh, started TM because I was interested in the deeper dimensions of yoga and the mind as discussed at that time uh, so eloquently by the TM movement and Maharishi. Okay, wow. and then uh, and then from there, uh, how did you become a yoga therapist? Okay, well, you know, okay, in, in graduate school I did a lot of sports, and I started the Iyengar practice to keep my hamstrings flexible. You know how that goes. Yeah, and as right. I get older, I I I laugh at my when I say it now. I started dropping the other sports and focus on yoga. It's kind of my orientation. Then I started studying with a man named A.G. Mohan in India, who was a student of Krishna Acharya's. And he really changed my notion of yoga and the practice of yoga. Because he was the first person I had met who combined the theory and the philosophy of yoga and the practice. And the whole focus of that orientation to yoga is helping the individual. And a fundamental question in that approach is, what's the purpose of your practice? What's the purpose of your practice? Now, that's a big question. But one part of that question is, when people have health problems, you can tailor the practice to help those individuals. Now, that was fascinating to me because I'm an economist by, I mean, that was my professional training, economics and finance. So I had not focused on 
bodies and health. So I found that fascinating to use yoga to approach like that. So I started studying deeply in that lineage and inherently in that lineage you can this, this yoga therapy, if I can use that term, but also given my professional orientation was economics, I could see that yoga was often a poster child, this was you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, a poster child for complementary and alternative health care. Because yoga, of course, is a visual thing, but it was never at the table. And they talked about integrative or complementary alternative health care policy. And they wanted health care approaches that engage people for stress reduction, lifestyle changes, mm -hmm. connected, a more holistic approach to health. Well, yoga does all that, but yoga was not at the table, so I became interested in making sure that we had, well, I came, became focused at trying to help yoga be seen as something that could assist and support all those broad objectives for dramatic improvements in healthcare and in approaches to healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, Phil? Yeah, John, maybe you can give us um, a, a little historic sense of the development of yoga therapy um, as distinct from what people would find in, in yoga studios. When did the discipline uh, originate and um, how did it evolve? Okay, that's a good question. So in some sense, it's been around a long time. If you adopt a yoga lifestyle, okay, which is also careful attention to diet and your attitude and exercise, all those things. So there were places in India that would emphasize the health aspect of yoga, uh, like the Kaivalyadama Yoga Institute, the Yoga Institute of Mumbai. They were some of the early pioneers in this. In fact, in the 20s, that's when they started. Uh, the first scientific research into yoga started at the Kaivalyadama Yoga Institute. And also, the Christian, I'm sure different teachers and lineages uh, incorporated some aspects of healthcare and yoga. But Krishnamacharya became famous for doing that. And then his student, Mr. Iyengar, became, of course, even more famous for what he called at that time medical yoga, or he would call them medical students. So Mr. Iyengar, many people over here don't really know that, that he, he had quite a thriving yoga therapy practice. I don't think he actually used that term very much. But so he used it, and then Krishnamacharya did that, and his son Deskachar did that at the Krishnachari Yoga Mandarin. You know, that started in the 60s, I believe. All and this then, in India, we should add. Yes, that's in India. But then the KY, well, Mr. Ayengar had, of course, lots of Western students, and Mr. Deskachar also had a lot of Western students. And, of course, uh, uh, Satchidananda had Dean Ornish as a student. Mm -hmm. Okay, So... Dean Ornish and other people were pioneers at uh, showing that a, what I'm going to call a yogic lifestyle. He would call it lifestyle changes. And he was researching this 30 years ago. He couldn't call it yoga. Right. A yogic, a, a yogic lifestyle was diet, exercise, and stress mm -hmm. reduction. Mm -hmm. And I, I could go all into that. But right. Let me just sit back for a second. For those just tuning in, you're listening to KRUULP 100.1 FM. My name is Dennis Rundy, my co-host, uh, Mr. Phil Goldberg, and our guest today, John Kepner, who is the executive director of the International Association of Yoga Therapists. One also mentioned June 4th to 7th, 2015, Symposium on Yoga Therapy and Research at Newport Beach, California. Uh, let, me, let me just uh, ask a question here. Uh, I probably know less about yoga than... Uh, Phil, and I'm sure I know a lot less about yoga than you do, John, but, but I've taken a number of yoga classes over the years, practiced meditation, and, uh, but my yoga has been sporadic. I, I've taken a class here, a class there. Some classes I've taken, 
were very easy and slow moving and gentle. Others were more rigorous. And there, there seems to be in the yoga world a real range from uh, yoga that's almost been turned into Western calisthenics to yoga that seemed uh, what I would call more traditional. Maybe I'm wrong. What type of yoga do you practice and recommend? Let's say somebody's listening in now. Say, I'm inspired. I want to get yoga for my health. Uh, how, how do they how do they find a good teacher? What would you recommend they do? Okay. First of all, most yoga lineages, or at least many of them, have therapeutic applications. Okay? Even some of the ones that are known as uh, vigorous. So it's not so much a lineage per se, it's an approach to practice. Then you've got to find a teacher who also has the space, the, the knowledge and the space to work with either an individual or a small group, okay? There's two ways to find people like that. One is to come to IYT's website, and we have a search function for members. But another good way is just ask in your local community who is good with yoga therapy, who is able to work with people individually, or if there are some small groups, sometimes they're called functional groups, things like back here or MS or things like that. Mm -hmm. So that you have, so and, and, and I also wanted to ask you, I, I noticed that your organization, the International Association of Yoga Therapists, accredits or endorses uh, uh, different uh, uh, yoga therapists. And I'm wondering when you go in to approve or, or accredit somebody, what do you look for? That's a very good question. Okay, I'm going to slightly rephrase that. We've gone through this, our field is going through the standards process. A transformative thing for any field. So we develop standards for the training of yoga therapists with representation from many different perspectives. We, then we develop a process for accrediting yoga therapist training programs that met those standards. These are all competency-based standards, which is the normal professional ways. And now we're beginning just starting the process of certifying individuals. So to certify individuals, they have to have, in our system now, a, a lot of training in a broad, many different approaches to yoga uh, therapy, both the philosophy of yoga, the structural part, the, the uh, uh, psychological part, and to some extent the spiritual part. And above all, they need to have what I'm going to call to, to know how to work with somebody therapeutically. What that means is you're not just, you're not treating this, the problem per se. In yoga, you work with somebody holistically. If a person comes to you for a back problem, you help them with the yoga practice that may help their back problem, but it's also a yoga practice that may support them in many other different ways. That's, I'm going to call that a therapeutic relationship as opposed to a typical yoga class where you're teaching somebody how to do a pose or how to do a, a vinyasa practice without consideration of the particular health conditions of the individual. Okay. Phil? So, John, maybe you can explain a little bit more about the, um, the organization that you represent and how, the, um, how it functions uh, in terms of quality control, because we know there's a lot of yoga teachers out there. And we also know that a lot of yoga teachers are better trained than others. So how do you, how do you maintain quality control? And, and let me just expand that a little bit. In, in certain other disciplines that um, develop over time and, and are shown to have therapeutic value, there ends up being... Um, usually a state-by-state -state licensing situation. So maybe you can address both those issues, the quality control and the uh, relationship to state licensing boards. Okay, very good question. Thanks for asking that. Okay, our standards are based on competencies, I'll say that again, which is, again, the normal professional way as opposed to just the number of hours 
by subject. Like the Yoga Alliance standards are hours by subject. We look at this, the, carefully look at the total curriculum of a, of a program, and what they teach, and how they assess the students, how they assess the students in this. Now, this is still a, it's a paper application. We're not, the field is not rich enough, if you will, to actually do site visits. But we have worked with the, all these schools. We've got 20, 20, only 20 accredited schools so far that have shown that their curriculum meets these standards for competencies. Okay? That's the first step. First step is to make sure the educational environment teaches what the field thinks is important. Okay? Second of all, then you certify individuals. Now, primarily, we will certify people who go through accredited programs. But in any field that starts with standards, you have to have a grand, a grand parenting process. So we'll be grandparenting people, some of which have been acting as yoga therapists for 10 or 20 years, but may not have had any formal education. Some have had shorter amounts of education. So it's always a challenge to do that, but you have to do that. I'm going to call our certification process. It's a big step, but it's not everything. Just when you start doing standards, that will raise, raise the level of training and experience for everybody. But it's not, it's not like an MD, which goes through four or eight years of training, or a law person are now a PT. And the, the level of training is not, that, not at that level. But it's a big step from nothing was what we had before. We had people calling themselves yoga therapists with widely different amounts of training. Uh, some schools were, like our, our standards, in addition to competencies, you have to have basically a thousand hours, a thousand hours, okay? The Yoga Alliance standards are 200 and 500, so ours are at least twice as much and there's much more rigorous review of the curriculum. Our standards are roughly at an early master's degree. Think of acupuncture mm -hmm. maybe 20, 25 years ago, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a step, but it's not, it's not perfect, anything like that. John, uh, 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 give us your website again so everybody has that. Okay, our website is IAYT. IAYT.org. And if you don't get that, but you're driving your car, uh, call into the station and I'll get it to you. Uh, I have a question for you. Suppose somebody comes to you, John, as a yoga uh, therapist and says, John, I'm feeling pretty good. As a matter of fact, I, I don't have any illness right now. Uh, I don't have any uh, aches or pains. I'm actually feeling pretty good. Uh, should I do yoga? And if I do yoga, how, how far can you take me? How good can life get? You know, is there some goal that I should have in mind? Uh, I, I, of course, you know, if you can help me with any illness or injury, great. But if, can we go past that? Can I reach some state of life where I'm feeling like uh, better than I can even imagine? Uh, so that's a very astute question. And let, let me give that in a context. So sometimes one of my teachers, Gary Kraftsow, who you may know, would call yoga both a life raft, and a launching pad, okay? So you're talking about somebody that wants to explore yoga as a launching pad to improve their life on lots of levels. And I would say yes, to try it. You know, you just try and see. But when you go to a yoga class, you typically feel better. Your mind is clearer. Your problems, to use my terms, your problems seem further away. My personal philosophy is that the best part of yoga is that it improves human relationships. Improves human relationships. So that's what I would say to try yoga and see if that improves your relationships. Very well put. I, I love that uh, uh, analogy of life raft and launching pad. For those just tuning in, you're listening to KRUULP. 100.1 FM. My name is Dennis Money. My co-host, Mr. Phil Goldberg, and our guest today 
on John Kepner, who is the executive director of the International Association of Yoga Therapists. They are having a symposium on yoga therapy and research in Newport Beach, California, this coming June 4th to 7th, 2015. Uh, John, can anyone attend that? Yes, anyone can, t- can attend, but it's aimed at yoga teachers and yoga therapists. Okay. So yoga, yoga teachers and yoga students who are interested in the field, it's a great opportunity to see what the professional field is really like. And if you go, you'll meet dozens of leading teachers and hundreds of other people that have the same questions you have. And, and you can find out if, about it by going to your website? Yes, yes. Great. Uh, Phil? And the bonus is they get to hear me speak. Oh, tell us about yeah. that. Uh, you're speaking at it. <laughs> tell us what will you be speaking well, about, Phil? Well, he, he, he is our, our keynote presenter, and we... Uh, I'm really lucky to have him. He has a lot to say, <laughs> and he's on the spot. He better be good. Great, give, give us a preview, Phil. So what will you be speaking on? Uh, that's, I forget my, the title of my talk, but they can look it up. Um, yes. <laughs> um, John, I, here's a question for you. Um, the um, people listening here um, may be familiar. Some people will have be familiar with the term yoga, and they'll associate it with uh, the physical practice that we see depicted uh, in magazine ads and so forth. The um, posture is called asanas. There will be other listeners uh, who are like Dennis and me who came to these traditions uh, primarily, originally, as spiritual seekers through the door of meditation. I started doing asanas after I'd been meditating a while because I discovered that it, it deepened my meditation. These days, most people come to yoga through asanas, and maybe they they discover that there's other practices like meditation and pranayama. In yoga therapy... To what extent does this repertoire of, of yoga that includes, in, in the classical sense, the eight limbs of yoga, which include asanas and pranayama and meditation and so forth, to what extent are they all part of the training and to what extent is it asana-oriented? Very good question. Okay. A typical training program will first focus on structural conditions, okay? So most people expect, like yoga for back here and neck problems or something like that. Then they will go into physiological conditions, asthma, digestion, you know, the different systems of the body. Then they might go into emotional issues, like dealing with what I'm going to call typical issues, garden variety, Uh, depression, anxiety, anger. Then they may go into, let's call it more, for lack of a better term, spiritual issues. And the good example I use is you're undergoing chemotherapy and you don't know if you're going to live or die. So they start with what, quote, most people think yoga therapy is about, structural issues, you approach with asana practice, but then they will go deeper and use more tools. And and most of the programs do teach this. It's still out there that most people think yoga therapy is a function of ours, is similar to physical therapy. But that's, that's not really true. But it takes an experienced teacher to really bring those other dimensions out. It's much easier to teach pasta practice than anything else. Phil, Phil let, let me ask you a, a, a question. And, and uh, Phil, uh, John, rather, I want to ask the question to you, but Phil wrote the book American Veda. And in the book, he points out that uh, how widely accepted yoga, meditation, these concepts are now. Uh, where do you see and where would you like to see uh, yoga? in our culture, in Western culture, 
Where, where would you like it to see, see it be situated in 5, 10, 20 years from now? Okay. What I would like to see in America are more really well-trained yoga teachers. Okay? We don't have very many. Okay? Think of the Buddhist lineages, at least where I live and see. The teachers in Buddhism tend to be extremely well-trained. Yoga is the opposite. Most of them are very lightly trained. So I would like to see very, very well-trained yoga teachers and then respected and seen as much. We don't. We have some. Yoga in America is getting deeper, but also broader. So we have both the depth and the breadth. And it's sometimes pretty hard for people to determine the, dif- the difference here. But we have. We have uh, both John, people. Yeah, John. We have about uh, four minutes left. What, okay. what other point, uh, Phil? Uh, a question. Yeah, John. Um, the um, the definition of yoga as classically defined in Patanjali, or as most people translate it, is union, the state of unity consciousness. I always think of yoga as both a practice and a state of consciousness. So you do yoga to attain yoga. Uh, you do the practices to attain unity consciousness. To what extent is that what we think of as the spiritual dimension of yoga in the in the sense of the Bhagavad Gita and so forth, uh, part of yoga therapy and to the extent that it is, is that an impediment to getting it accepted in mainstream public context? <laughs> That's some hard questions. <laughs> As as people get deeper into yoga, they become, at least in my experience, more open to this more classical notion of yoga, as you described it, okay? Mm-hmm. But right now, most discussions of that with, with integrative medicine don't bring that aspect up to it, and it probably is a, what a, is a turn-off. So most of the research is focused on uh Physical issues are actually most of the more research is actually focused on yoga for mental conditions. We don't know that, you know, depression and stuff like that. Um, so I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't bring that aspect up mm-hmm. to in the context of integrated medicine. Although more and more people involved now, you know, in their fifties and sixties, have been around yoga for a long time, so they're a little more open to that than they used to be. And what about the research uh, element that you just actually brought into the uh, conversation? I, I got to just much uh, research John, has been done? Phil, Phil, we have about one minute left, so okay. Yeah. there is a fair amount, a growing amount of research. Research is actually conducted by researchers in medical schools, and yoga is classified as a mind-body medicine by the National Institutes of Health. In fact, there's so much research that some people are saying. Why should we keep researching it as a complementary alternative medicine? Because it's getting more and more accepted here. Very interesting. Thank you so much, John. Phil, you're listening to KRUULP 100.1 FM. My name is Dennis Ramundi. My show, Speaking Freely, my co-host today, Mr. Phil Goldberg, who is the author of American Veda. If you haven't read the book, read it. It's uh, excellent and very insightful. And our guest today, Mr. John Kepner who is the executive director of the International Association of Yoga Therapists, their symposium uh, in uh, Newport Beach, California, this coming June 4th to 7th, 2015. And the symposium will be on yoga therapy and research. John, fascinating. Love to have you back on. We need more time with you. Uh, And I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come on with Phil and I today. Thank you. I really enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to seeing more of what you've been doing. Great. Okay.